Hey, everybody. Welcome in. It is a Tuesday mailbag edition of the Utopia Football Podcast. Great to be with you. I'm Sean Pendergast, one half of Pain and Pendergast on Sports Radio 610. A very happy, happy Tuesday, Wednesday, whenever you're listening to this, to all of you. Um, and w- what's not to be happy about? The Texans are 4-1. and one. The pundits all think they're a really good football team. Uh, the power rankings that I look at every Tuesday have the Texans anywhere from eighth, which is SI.com. We hate them all the way up to third, which is ESPN.com and CBSSports.com. Generally speaking, the two undefeated teams are getting the top billing right now, the Minnesota Vikings and the Kansas City Chiefs. But by and large, the Texans are thought to be one of the, well, they're the only one loss team in the AFC. I haven't really looked at the NFC standings to see What's what? I know the Lions have one loss over on that side of the ledger. I know the Commanders do. Um, You know, of all the one-loss teams, there seems to be some skepticism with the Commanders just because we don't know what Jaden Daniels really is yet. Five games into his rookie year. So a lot of excitement. Um, And it's kind of fun seeing a lot of excitement with teams that had in the over the previous several years been kind of downtrodden, Washington specifically having to live through Daniel Snyder for 25 years. This is I'm happy for those people. That's a huge payoff for them that they may have found their quarterback, and I'm happy for us here. We didn't go as long with incompetency as the Washington folks did for so, so very long. We just had a few glitchy years from 2020 through 2022, but we've come out the other side, and it feels really good. And um, I got a lot of mailbag questions to get to, man. You guys – if the listenership and the downloads reflect the number, if, there, if there's a correlation between that and the mailbag, then things are good right now here in Utopia. So um, appreciate you guys uh, tuning in. As always, appreciate the feedback. Um, the, the other thing that you could do if you are so inclined, if you haven't done so already, is hit the subscribe button. Um, subscribe to the podcast. That makes it easy on all of us. It means you get the podcast automatically. You don't have to go seeking it out. We are in the middle of what is a well, not in the middle, but we are um, we're five games into what has the makings of a very special Texan season. So let's all ride with this thing together. Give it a subscribe, give it a rate, give it a review, whatever it is you want to do. It all helps, and uh, mostly tell a friend. I get a lot of emails of you guys saying that you really love the podcast. This is your favorite Texans podcast, whatever the case may be. Um, if you share it with some other Texan fans, that would be phenomenal. So, but I appreciate the support big time. Um, a quick reminder too, if you do want to send a, an email, if you haven't sent one before, if you sent one, it didn't make it into this mailbag, whatever the case may be, um, H O U mailbag at gmail.com. Let me commend all of you. Um, amidst the sea of emails that I got, you guys really are good at following instructions. I didn't get any, you know, long six paragraph emails. I've, I've been getting a few of those. I really appreciate the thought that goes into those. It's just, I don't have time to read them. So I don't want to waste anybody's time. So good job on that. So we have some regulars that that uh, that love emailing, and, uh, and and you guys did good, really, really good this week. So let's get right to it. And before we get into the the mailbag, I guess the biggest news with the Texans is probably Nico Collins uh, and his hamstring that he pulled while scoring a sixty seven yard touchdown against the uh, against the oh my god Buffalo Bills on Sunday. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a little tired. Um, and, and it sounds like to me, from, from the way that D'Amico phrased his answer, he called Nico week to week. He said sometimes it takes a couple weeks for these hamstrings to, whatever he said, go away or heal or whatever. That tells me he's for sure going to be gone this weekend. And I think even if he were ready or almost ready to go, I think this is a game, not that I want to diminish any other NFL team, but this should be a game that home or away, and this one's away, this should be a team in New England that you should be able to beat without Nico Collins. I mean, you still got Stefan Diggs, Tank Dell, Dalton Schultz, CJ Stroud pulling the trigger. Um, maybe Joe Mixon back. We'll see. This should not be a game where if you lose it, not having Nico Collins is the excuse. So Green Bay is a huge game just in terms of the marquee. This is actually a more meaningful game, the Patriots game, just because it's in the AFC. So if conference record comes into play in a tiebreaker down the road, this is empirically a more meaningful game, but that Green Bay game is going to be a real measuring stick game, I think, for both teams, especially with Green Bay now having Jordan Love back under center. 
So, um, so that's, yeah, that's really the only hardcore Texans news. We'll keep an eye on Titus Howard's injury this week. Christian Harris is not coming back anytime soon. We've got a lot of questions about all these guys. So I'll let you guys do the talking the rest of the way here. And let's dive into the mailbag again, H O U mailbag at gmail.com. We'll start with Ryan Lynn with the Texans only scoring 20.4 points per game. Is it safe to call this game against new England a quote trap game? This feels like a game a true contender figures out how to win. A hundred percent, this is a game a true contender figures out how to win. And I don't know that the Texans, how they're doing offensively makes it a trap game. Um, I think the potential to look ahead to that Green Bay game, maybe. More so to me, it's coming off of the emotion and another week just full of rat poison, as they like to call it. You know, people pumping the Texans up. It's impossible to ignore your own press clippings if you're in your 20s these days because you're for sure on social media and the social media apps curate it for you. I'm guessing that they know that C.J. Stroud and Will Anderson and other guys, Derek Stingley, I'm guessing the the, the algorithm knows that they like looking at Texan stuff. So they're going to see all this stuff. It's impossible to avoid the rat poison. That would be my biggest concern. I'm not concerned about the Texans offense. I think it's going to continue to evolve. I think C.J. Stroud has not hit – his ceiling yet, uncharacteristic turnovers in the last game. I don't think that's a trend that's going to hold up. So um, I'm more worried about coming coming off of two straight home games, one a division game, one a game that's I'll call it a conference game because you know I think you I think the Texans are viewed more as competing with the Bills than the Jags at this point, even though the Jags are in the Texans division. But at any rate, it's two games that have a lot of emotion tied up in them that you won late. In, in dramatic fashion, my fear is for an emotional letdown in this game. I, I they'd, it'd have to be a real letdown to lose to this Patriots team, who's abysmal offensively and might be starting a rookie quarterback. Um, but but yeah, I think it fits the definition of a trap game. I'm more worried about the emotional aspect of this game than I am the um, the offense not quite hitting its stride yet. I am anxious to see what Bobby has in store. Not having Nico out there, it looked very different in the second half of the, the game against the uh, the Bills on Sunday with no Nico in there. So that was a little jarring. Um, so that's how I feel on that. Ryan, I appreciate the email. Jason and Leander, no wrestling question today, Jason. Damn. Um, has Kenyon Green met, exceeded, or fallen short of your hopes for him this year? Mike had the same question. Said, great job, as always, with the morning show and the podcast. What's your assessment of Kenyon Green as a starting left guard? On one hand, no question, he looks fit. But on the other, I think some of the other stats aren't great. I would say Kenyon Green has met expectations for me. I don't think he's exceeded them, um, and I won't say he's fallen short. He's not been great, but I didn't expect him to be great, having not played football for a year. Um, to me, the biggest the biggest place Kenyon Green has exceeded things is just, is just to Mike's point how he looks physically. He clearly took the off season very very seriously, and they're going to roll with him as long as he's healthy at left guard. Um, just cause I, I mean, I don't know that the, the Kendrick green is a much better solution than Kenyon green. I think you just got to hope that he gets the rust off. He develops and he becomes just a really just an average left guard. I think would be, would be fantastic. I know they used a, a first round pick on him. I would take five average offensive linemen in a heartbeat right now. So, um, so I think that's the thing to me, a successful year for Kenyon green will be if the Texans pick up his fifth year option. If they pick up his fifth-year option, it means he did some good things this year. It means he did a, enough good things to where they're willing to to uh, to bite off a fifth year of a pretty hefty, relatively speaking, hefty salary to keep him around. So that would be a successful year for me with Kenyon. But Kenyon's had some rough snaps. He's had some good snaps. He's definitely worth, to me, still starting for the Texans. I don't think this is a five-alarm fire where you got to get Kenyon Green out of there. Um. You know, I, I uh, Clint Sterner brought this up in the post game show, and and it's a it's a valid point that the interior, their offensive line, Green, Scruggs, and Shaq Mason, they might be more built to be doing some downhill blocking instead of a lot of the athletic stuff that goes with the Kubiak Shana, uh, Shanahan offense. So we'll see if they adjust. You know, Bobby Slowick seemed to be getting to a day of reckoning in his last press conference where he's realizing, like, all right, there's only so many games we can spend running our running backs into a brick wall. Getting Joe Mixon back will be a big help whenever that is. So appreciate the question, fellas, on Kenyon Green. 
Kyle in Denver, love the show. I've searched far and wide, and I consider this the best Texans podcast. Thank you, Kyle. I appreciate that. What do you think the issue is with the offense in the second half of games? Sloak seems like he has a hard time adjusting, not to mention the rock brain call. Rock brain. I like that. On third and five at the end of the game. You're the man. Thanks. Thanks, Kyle. You're the man, too. Um, to me, to me, the offense in the second half of games, I don't know if it's a hard time adjusting. This team just can't run the football. And early in games, they're able to, you know, first half of games, they've been able to overcome it. Um, CJ has has had time to throw. He's able to put drives together. Um, the second half of games, quite honestly, there's been a bit more of a turnover issue this year than there was in previous, you know, than there was last year. Um, I just think it all circles back to me when this team cannot run the football. And in the second half of this game last week, guys were having trouble uh, more trouble getting open because Nico wasn't out there. That's when you, you know, that that's that's when you run into it. I I don't have a great explanation for the massive lulls this team has offensively. There are so many games, and this goes back to last year, where they're just on the cusp of breaking it open. This game against the Bills on Sunday, they they scored two touchdowns. They had a great touchdown drive that ended with the Cam Akers touchdown. They had the one play drive where Nico catches the deep ball. Even after Nico went out. The drive that ended with Daria Gumbawale getting stopped on fourth and one, which is the next drive. They're driving to make it 21 to three at that point. And then just an awful play call on fourth and one, just horrible execution, horrible play call. And, and all of a sudden the bills have a little bit of momentum back. Now it took till the second half for them to capitalize on that, but that seemed to take some starch out of the Texans a little bit. They would tack on a field goal before the end of the half. Um, but they they actually had in that Buffalo game, I would say, you know, I think they had 12 drives total. I would say like seven of them were really good drives, like where they were moving the ball, but you short circuit yourself with a with, with a, a fourth and one stop. Um, the drive where CJ ended up throwing the interception, that was another drive where they had burned five and a half minutes a clock and they're driving down to potentially go back up by 10 points, 27 to 17, and CJ throws the pick. So I don't have a great answer for you, Kyle, as to the reasons. I just know it's really frustrating. The lulls that this team goes through offensively. Um, credit the defense. That's the big thing. You know, the defense has been bailing the offense out the last couple of weeks, especially in the fourth quarter of games. Larry is in Norway. You know I love the global emails, man. Longtime listener, born in Houston, living in Norway. What do you think the fallout will be around the Josh Allen concussion process during this game? It's hard to believe he passed the protocol that quickly was given smelling salts, and had an ankle injury. Do you think the NFL will crack down on hiding concussions after two is very public issues? Keep up the good work. I'm not seeing anything from the NFL or anybody reporting on the NFL that shows the Bills are going to get punished for putting Josh Allen back into the game. My guess is it's a hard thing to prove that it was done negligently. Um, these are independent neurologists that they have evaluating Josh Allen. So, you know, unless you've got you know, three of Josh Allen's teammates in there getting ready to tear limbs off the guy or holding his family hostage. This, these are independent neurologists. Now, do they all have the same, do they all have sort of the same, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, scale for what constitutes going back into game? I don't know. I don't know enough about concussions or the symptoms of concussions. Um, and I have not seen the smelling salts thing. Is that real that he was given smelling salts? I've not seen I've tried to find video of them giving Josh Allen smelling salts. Like to me, if you're having to give somebody smelling salts, that's an automatic that they shouldn't go back in the game if they need smelling salts. What is this? 1972? What are we, Rocky sitting on a stool getting ready for Apollo Creed to cave my face in? Come on now. Um, so I think the NFL is doing a better job with concussions. Um, but uh, and that would have been a bigger story for us as Texans if Allen had been able to lead the Bills to a victory. He was 0 for 5 passing the football after he got his head bounced off the turf. All right, appreciate the uh, appreciate the love in Norway, uh, Larry. Thank you very much. Uh, John Thompson, my longtime friend, has uh, asked, what has happened to Deshaun Watson? <laughs> that may need a separate podcast, John. Uh, John hypothesized. He said, did he, did he A, just hit his football expiration date? B, like playing like his mind is somewhere else, like he's dreading the upcoming lawsuit? C, being in the spotlight and playing football just isn't fun anymore, or D, something else. Okay, let's take each of these one at a time. Has he hit his football expiration date? 
Maybe, but that's to be determined. He's still at an age where that shouldn't be the case. B, is his mind somewhere else like he's dreading the upcoming lawsuit? He just settled that lawsuit yesterday. I, I know this email probably came in before that became news, but the latest email where he was literally accused of rape um, was settled, I believe yesterday the news came out um, that that was settled. So he doesn't have any, any, well, he's got the, I think one lawsuit still left over from all the massage stuff. I can't imagine it's one lawsuit that is torpedoing his mental state. I have a theory on this. I'll share in a second. Um, C being in the spotlight and playing football isn't fun anymore. That's a hundred percent. He does not look like he's having any fun. You can read it in his body language. Go watch a press conference. He's got no answers for why he's playing so shitty. D something else. And this was my theory from the second that all this stuff came out about Deshaun in conjunction with him wanting to get traded from here. We knew that when this, when the dust all settled with the lawsuits and the lawsuits themselves got settled and Deshaun was going to be able to come back and play football after his 11 game suspension, my theory all along, and I feel stronger about it now than ever. And Deshaun has even said things in press conferences that have validated my theory when he's asked about being a villain, when he's asked about not having the love from his fans or whatever, Deshaun Watson is somebody who must be liked. He must be liked. He needs it like oxygen for people to worship him. And nobody's worshiping him right now. I think that messes with Deshaun mentally. And if you're close to Deshaun or if you dispute that, maybe you're a fan of Deshaun or maybe you're a Clemson fan or whatever, you can dispute it all you want. The burden of proof is way more on you than it is on me because he's sucked since he became public enemy number one, or I don't know, maybe he's, maybe he's like public enemy number four now. Maybe he's pushed down the list a little bit, um, but I don't feel sorry for him. I don't feel sad for him. I hear people saying, it's, boy, it's just sad watching him play football. Not for me. Not for me, it's not. He didn't want to be here anymore, and there's a really good chance he's kind of a creep. So I don't. it ain't sad for me, man. I watch those Deshaun press conferences and I enjoy watching them. I'm, I enjoy watching a guy who's vastly overpaid have to twist in the wind for eight minutes after a game on Sunday. It's a small price to pay. My theory, John, is that his role, his position as a heel, if you will, to use a wrestling term for bad guy, is not something he likes and it's not something he's wired for. It's not something he's built for. And I think it's spilling over onto the field. It's as good a theory as any. All right. Thanks, John. Chuck in Denver. Have you made your hotel reservations for the Super Bowl in New Orleans yet? Just kidding, but that was an awesome game against Buffalo. How did the O-line do penalty-wise? Don't remember hearing of any holds or pre-snap stuff. Yeah, I thought the offensive line, at least in terms of discipline, did a good job. There was one, I think Shaq Mason had a holding penalty. Kenyon had a penalty in there. Laramie had no penalties, and so that was big. I don't think Blake Fisher had any either, and that was huge too. We haven't talked about Blake Fisher, but he started in place of Titus Howard. And he didn't have any penalties. So I think that's huge, man, for a rookie. Starting right tackle, going up against a pretty good front to not have any penalties. So, yeah, kudos to the offensive line there. Now they just need to run block better. They need to pass protect better. They just need to be better. As far as have we made our hotel reservations for the Super Bowl in New Orleans yet, the funny thing is we actually have as a station. I think we're staying in some sort of Airbnb with like eight bedrooms or something like that. I don't know. I'm guessing that we're going to have webcams all over this thing and you guys are going to be able to kind of go on the trip with us. And if the Texans make the Super Bowl, then we'll be there probably through Monday or Tuesday. Um, as it is, if they don't make it, we'll be there in New Orleans through Friday, unless some of us choose to stay the weekend. I did last year in Vegas and went to the Gronk party and the Shack party. So I had fun. So I may stick around. I don't know. But we are going to the Super Bowl again as a station. So I, I know you were being, I know, Chuck, you were being kind of tongue in cheek about the Texans actually going to the Super Bowl. But it's worth mentioning we as a station are going to be going to New Orleans. And so, um, man, hopefully I see a bunch of you there because that would mean the Texans are in the Super Bowl in all likelihood. So appreciate the question, Chuck. Lane asks, Hey, Sean, I was wondering what you thought of the new uniforms used on Sunday and how can I see Kaimi's post game interview that you guys did? That, the interview, for those who don't know, Kaimi was our uh, player of the game. He was our in-studio interview that uh, Clint Sterner and I did. He was great. I thought he was excellent. Uh, really cool insight on just the mental process that he goes through as a kicker. Um, a lot of talk about guys like Kobe Bryant and Tiger Woods and guys that go through those 
mental exercises to try to hone greatness. Um, so Kaimi was, was really good. We got him to pose with my WWE championship belt. That's kind of the new thing after Texans wins only only after wins. Um, the player of the game poses with the, uh, with the belt. So, um, we've had three wins so far at home. Kaimi posed with it. Daria Gumbawale posed with it. Daniil Hunter was the guest after the Chicago game, the home opener. It was so late at night and Daniil seemed, even though they won, Daniil was in kind of a scary mood. He's just a, he's a very soft spoken, frightening person. And I had not yet done any belt picks with any players yet. And I was just like, I don't know if he's going to be the first. He looks for a guy who just won a game. He looks agitated. He's the only player, Daniil Hunter, to ever come into the interview room with me and Clint still wearing parts of his uniform. Most of the guys shower, they put on their, you know, all their, all their, you know, their, their, their drip, you know, they got the great clothes on. A lot of them have chains and things like that. Clint loves asking about the chains, how much they're worth, what's the significance of it, things like that. Daniil Hunter had on white spandex leggings, uh, like a wife beater spandex t-shirt and still had eye black on his face. It still smelled like he played a football game. You know what I mean? Like he was straight off the field. But I got Dari and I got Kaimi, the two kickers on the football team. Um, so we'll see who's next. The next home game is not till week eight. So it'll be a while until we do any sort of belt stuff again. Um, but I, I say all that to say, I don't know, Lane, that you can see the Kaimi interview anywhere. That's the property of the Texans. That's not 610 property or anything. So that's, I don't know the answer to that. Um, my guess is it's nowhere because um, I don't think we were filming it. Um, now, there may be podcasts of it on the Texans app. I don't know if they put the postgame show on the Texans app or not. You may want to check that out. Um, to answer your first question, I love the new uniforms. The only problem I have with the new unif- with this version of the new uniforms, because they're all new, there's four different versions. The one they wore on Sunday, the, the H-Town Color Rush ones, I guess repping rep in H-Town uniforms, whatever we're calling it, the numbers are really hard to read from up in the press box. And they were even hard to, to read on TV too. So those red numbers, um, I think they're cool looking just in the store, hanging on a hanger from a practical standpoint. It's really, really tough. I can't imagine being the person in the press box that has to identify tacklers and things like that. I mean, it's tough to see those numbers. They're badass. I mean, the uniforms are awesome. I love the one they wore Sunday. Um, I like the red ones. I mean, the helmet with the red ones, with the horns. Um, I thought the H looked really cool on the helmet this weekend. I'm a uniform mark. Like, it takes a lot for me to be super critical about a new uniform. Probably the new uniform across all teams in Houston that I was critical of immediately was the Astros Space City uniforms. I just didn't like those from the jump. I don't like all dark blue baseball uniforms. Um, I thought it was way too involved and I didn't like the font and all that. So I, that's probably the only uniform recently. And by the way, they're getting rid of those. So that's the only uniform recently where I just haven't really liked it at all. Um, just my own take. I, you know, I ain't mad about it or anything. It's just, I wouldn't, I, I, I wouldn't buy it. I didn't, I didn't like it. These new Texan uniforms are, are amazing. I, I really like them a lot and I've liked them from, from day one. <laughs> um, BK. BK knew that I was probably talking to him a little bit when I talked about the long emails. He says, I was told not to write long to understand others are writing emails too, and that I should be brief and to the point. This is not the Declaration of Independence. He wants me to read this in France in the North. Well, I can't do this. <laughs> okay, maybe I'll try. It has become necessary to dissolve the penalties that have plagued our beloved Texans than to assume from the Astros the powers of the postseason here on Earth. We hold these truths to be self-evident that not all quarterbacks are created equal, that Stroud has been endowed by his creator with the arm of a God among men, that we and our countrymen all collectively pray for the soft tissue, damn right, of Nico Collins and look to secure his blessings for games to come, that life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, be that tank, digs, and a combo of Xavier and Woods shall not allow downfield throws to perish from this earth our question on most high, will Tank get more looks in space? Seems like he and CJ started to have more of a rhythm on Sunday, but need more. Seems like Fisher played well, too. How did he grade out per PFF in the eye test from Utopia? Supported this declaration with a firm reliance of the protection of divine providence. We mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor 
and around three hours every Sunday. The European mind could never comprehend. That is from BK. And he wants me to read. I, it's hard to do. France in the North is just sort of a phrase. It's not a voice that that I can extrapolate out to read long declarations like this one. I agree with the sentiment in, in most of what you're writing here, BK. Um, pray for Nico's soft tissue. Let's get Tank some touches this weekend. I don't know how Fisher graded out per PFF. I still haven't re-upped my PFF subscription yet. Um, they've got a bad credit card for me or like an expired credit card. And I just haven't had the inkling to go drop 129 bucks yet on their grades. I love PFF. I just like at the last second I get cheap. I'm like, ah, I can go one more week without it. Um, which is, I, which is not true. I, I really do need it. Um, uh, I thought Fisher was fine. Seth thought he played well, considering it was his first start. I really trust Seth's opinion on stuff like this. So um, it'll be interesting to see if we get another look at Blake Fisher this week. I, you know, uh, Titus has a hamstring also. We've got a triumvirate of hamstring injuries. Pierce, Titus, and uh, and Nico. All right, thanks, BK. Uh, Bobby in the Hill Country, is there any word on when Christian Harris is expected to return? Yes, 2046. I have no idea when he's coming back. This is um, this. It's a calf injury, and Christian Harris, since the beginning of training camp, has participated in like 30 minutes of one training camp practice, and that's it. And the weirdest thing about it is not so much that it's a calf injury that's lingering like this. I'm guessing this isn't the first calf injury to go, let's see, July, August, September. I mean, he'll be coming up on three months that we know of that he's been dealing with this thing. Um, it's just like how – how unpresent Christian Harris has been like at training camp, even when Laramie's hurt and Joe Mixon is hurt and, you know, Phil and any net Tim settle was hurt and uh, Jeff Okuda was hurt. They were all working out, out at practice on the field next to where the Texans were. Like you could watch them work out. Um, Christian Harris was nowhere to be seen. So it's just, it's really strange. It's a calf injury. Who knows? Who I, Bobby? I have no answer on that one, and and they ain't giving up answers on that one either for whatever reason. Um, says thank you and enjoy the podcast. Thank you, Bobby. I appreciate that. Um, we've got a few more left here. Ben, love the win. Uh, talking about the Bills win, even though the point total killed a really nice parlay I had going. Um, that's the life of the gambler, Ben. You know that. Uh, I hate how frequently the offensive plays point of attack is behind the line of scrimmage. Too many draws, screens, bubble screens and end arounds. I understand they can't go deep all the time, but starting a play in reverse is rarely the right move. They do well when they're aggressive, be aggressive. I, I don't think it's that simple. I don't think you just drop CJ back 50 times a game and just start chunking the ball down the field. Plays are used to set up other plays. Um, yeah, my, my issue with the draws, the screens, bubble screens and end arounds is they're just, I don't have an issue with an offense using them if they're good at them. Um, I just don't know how good this team is at that part of the game. I they're mediocre. They're better than the O'Brien teams were at that stuff. Um but it it feels like so, like some of the end around stuff with Tank, it feels like teams have kind of figured that out. Now, I brought that up on the show today and Seth brought up a good counterpoint which is sometimes it's the threat of Tank doing that. Like yeah, they may have lost 5 yards on that end around, but the threat of Tank being out there may have opened some other stuff up in plays that we're not talking about. Um I to me the biggest stuff is I don't know how good they are at the the tricky stuff, like even the, even the digs touchdown against Jacksonville, where he ran it in. Remember, he kind of took a handoff and from CJ, and he was supposed to throw it back across the field. Well, it wasn't designed to do what Stefan Stefan Diggs did. Stefan Diggs just happens to be a great player and was able to kind of meet, you know, kind of weave his way through and run the ball in. It's it, you know, and I'm I'm going to use Kansas City here, and I understand I'm using the best team in football as the benchmark, but when they line up to do this tricky stuff, nobody says boo like they're like oh this is gonna work you know like it because it does with Andy Reid like last night's Monday night game you had Travis Kelsey lined up in Wildcat with Quincy uh not, not Quincy um Xavier Worthy next to him on one side and he had another chief lined up next to him on the other side and and it worked they ran an RPO down near the goal line that Xavier Worthy runs in like he's a running back for a touchdown you, you know Mahomes has those little shovel plays down near the goal line you know sometimes even behind the back um, you know, this stuff works with Kansas city. I just, the Texans, the Texans need to get better at the conventional stuff before they get a little too fancy. That's my, my thought on that. Um, all right, Joe Q 
He says, let's look across the league with this question. In the spirit of first quarter report cards and all that, which fan base feels like Christmas came early, like the football gods have chosen them for special favor? Okay, that's an easy one, and it's Washington, and it's not even close. Like, this is a franchise that went through two and a half decades or more of Daniel Snyder as the owner. I mean, there is no there is no worse feeling as a fan than when you've got poor ownership, and especially when they seem like they're despicable human beings. Um, no more helpless feeling when you have owners that are making bad decisions. We had owners that were making bad decisions for a little while there here in Houston. Pretty helpless feeling because the owners aren't going anywhere. Thankfully, that same family is making incredible decisions now. And they've hired people who are making incredible decisions as well. Um, so credit to the McNairs, but it's got to be Washington. I mean, not only not only are you rid of Daniel Snyder, I like I feel like in Washington, they would have bargained and said, Well, we will give up being in the postseason for the next 10 years if it means getting rid of this guy as owner. Um He's that bad. He's awful. That the fact that the, not only are they rid of him, but they're four and one, and they have a quarterback who's literally a rookie on a rookie contract, who's one of the toasts of the league right now. It's easily Washington, um, to me. Uh, conversely, Joe Q asked which fan bases are sharpening pitchforks and lighting torches upon finding out that Homer Simpson is the head coach, GM, and QB rolled into one. That is equally easy, and that would be the Cleveland Browns. No question about it. I, I actually listen to a fair amount of Cleveland radio. As far as out-of-market radio goes, I listen to a decent amount of Cleveland radio because um, I love hearing what they're saying about Deshaun. They're just so miserable right now with him. And um, and that's that that's another helpless one. And 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 Jimmy Haslam and D Haslam as owners, I don't think they're I, I mean, I don't know. I'm not around their team every day. They don't seem like great owners. I don't know what kind of people they are. Um, they were desperate for Deshaun Watson to become their quarterback, even with all those lawsuits. So there is a definite cutthroat aspect to them, which I'm not judging them for. It's sports. I understand it. Um, but between having owners that I think are at the very least suspect being stuck with Deshaun Watson for, I mean, you're stuck with, you're either stuck with him or the cap hit one or the other. You can't get rid of them both. And now that Deshaun settled this lawsuit, um, he ain't getting suspended either. I, there were Browns fans hoping that Deshaun would get suspended because it would have nullified some of the guarantees in his contract. It would have saved them tens of millions of dollars on the salary cap if they were to move on from him. That ain't happening now um, because he settled that lawsuit. It's Cleveland. Like when literally when you have a team, when you have a fan base that's rooting for their quarterback to get suspended so it can nullify half of the shittiest contract in the history of the sport, that's a tough spot to be in, man. And I'm glad it's not us. I'm glad it's them. Uh, you know, point blank, period. I'm sure they weren't shedding a ton of tears up in Cleveland when Jack Easterby was running rough shot over everybody. So better them than us. That's sports. All right. Uh, Charles says, one stock down for me is with Slowick, Bobby Slowick. The most head-scratching play for me was the fourth and one in the red zone. I agree with that. Why in the world did you have Dare go for that run play? Agreed. He is not the type of running back you want in that situation. I don't know that they had one on the team you would want in that situation on Sunday. Um, they would have done better having CJ do a QB sneak. I don't think they they would have been better putting the ball in CJ's hands and letting him do something in the passing game. There were just way too many bodies up near the line of scrimmage to run it with anybody. I And I don't need CJ QB sneaking. I just don't need that. I, it's a little like Jordan Alvarez. I don't need him sliding. I don't need CJ sticking his head down into a, into a mass of people who don't really give a shit about CJ Stroud. So I disagree on the play call. I, I, you know, I don't think it would have done better with CJ doing a QB sneak and it could have gotten CJ hurt. I think if you're going to line up like that and you do something, there's nothing stopping you from, you know, uh, using a little trickery there. And I, by trickery, I mean, just fake the handoff and leak a tight end out into the flat. You're looking to get a yard at that point. Thanks, Charles. Oh, look who it is. It's France in the North. Got to meet France in the North uh, this week. Came up to the studio with his lovely family. Um, they got to watch Seth and I do their do our magic up there. Uh, got to see him at the game, take a picture up on the stage. So that was cool. France, I'm sure that's going to be your Christmas card this year, uh, your family and me. Um, so, um, so Merry Christmas. 
Uh, <laughs> I'm just joking. Who would uh, France actually has a football question? Um, and oh, and his daughter made me the, my uh, friendship bracelet here that says Utopia on it that I still wear every day. Uh, Marquisa, I got her name right this time. All right, Marquisa. So uh, appreciate her. Um, France in the Knoll asks, who would be your two unsung players from the win over the Bills offense and defense? I would say unsung player on offense, Dalton Schultz had some big catches in that game. He had some big chain moving, field position changing, getting out of the shadows of your goalpost type catches in that game. And I'm hoping that this is the beginning, especially with Nico out now for a, for a bit, that this is the beginning of Dalton Schultz kind of getting his legs under him and getting going. So I would say Schultz on offense. And then on, on defense, uh, I would say unsung on defense. Hmm. I mean, Aziz was not unsung. He was, uh, he was in, I would say somebody unsung on defense this season. Oh, you know who? E Eric Murray. Eric Murray. Eric Murray's had a strung a few good games together here. He had a couple passes defended in that game. He was very tight in coverage. Granted, they're not covering the 99 Rams receiving core or anything like that. Um, but Eric Murray has been real solid. He's somebody I'm – there's times the last few years I'm shocked he's still on the team. I think he's getting better now than he was when Bill O'Brien and Jack Easterby paid him like he was Ronnie Lott or something. Um so I'm going to say Eric Murray unsung. If you go back and watch the game, Murray made a few plays there. He's been a really he's been a really crucial piece because it's it's allowed them. Jimmy Ward has had injuries, and so they've needed Eric Murray. Kalen Bullock is a rookie. Do you want to put a full serving on his plate? No. Good thing you have Eric Murray. Hey, we want to play Jalen Petrie up near the line of scrimmage. Cool. We've got Eric Murray at safety. These are things I never thought I'd be saying, but Eric Murray has been really solid for the Texans this year. Unsung play in the game. Uh, two unsung plays from Robert Woods, the 36 yard return to set up the field goal at the end of the half and the 13 yard return to set up the field goal at the end of the game. I know Robert Woods had a return where he pinned the Texans deep on their own two yard line, inexcusable. Um, and yet I'm about to excuse it here because those two returns basically, they don't score those six points without those two returns. And in a three point game, that's huge, especially it led to literally the winning points. So good job, Robert Woods. Um, France in the North says we're all really excited for the duo of Aziz and Christian Harris. Your thoughts on Henry's play this year? I almost answered Henry Toa Toa, France, uh, for the unsung defensive guy. So that gives you an idea of of um of what I think of Henry Toa Toa. I think he's been very solid, very solid this year. Um, France says for our family to attend our first game couldn't have gone any better, even if they had lost the full experience from tailgating, the atmosphere, the people, fans, workers, sports media. All were amazing, man. I hope you come back, dude. That was cool. That's that. That was France's family's first Texan game, and I would say this to anybody that's listening to this podcast from out of town that if you plan on coming in for a game, is to get in touch with me and let me know so you can come by the pregame show and we can take pictures and things like that, um, like up on the stage with with me and Seth. And it's so yeah, like, uh, you guys are loyal listeners. I want to take care of you. So um, so let me know. Uh, email mailbag at gmail.com and let me know that you're coming in and even put it in the subject header, you know, with something like, Hey, coming in for such and such game. Um, cause I, I love meeting you guys face to face. I think it's just, it's a really cool community that we've got here. All right. Two more. And then I'm out. Uh, Gunner says we'll miss Nico Collins next week when he's not on the field. We see CJ suffer a little bit more. Isn't this the reason we got Stefan Diggs anyways? Um, let me, let me stop right there. Yes. I've said this from this. I've said this since training camp. There's so many people that think they got Stefan Diggs to put this team over the top. And now you got Nico and Stefan and tank, and we're going to plunder the world, which by the way, has not been true yet. They've been fine. They're four and one and they've had their moments, but they haven't done. They've rarely had all three guys on the field at the same time, which is why I think that's an even bigger reason they got Stefan Diggs. Because you don't want to have any more games where you trot Tank out as your primary guy, which happened a couple times last year, or Nico as your primary guy without Tank. Both of them have had injury issues. And so I think you get – Stefan Digg has been a rock in his career. One thing you can count on him for, availability. Plus, he's still really, really good play-to-play -play as a wide receiver. So I, I think they got Stefan Diggs to me as much so they knew they would have – 
in all likelihood, at least two really good receivers on the field at all times, then like, oh, we're going to have three great ones, you know? So again, like people that are, that want to criticize the Stefan Diggs trade. And there were people out there doing it. Imagine going up to new England this week and you've got tank Dell and then Xavier Hutchinson is your number two. This trade was a great trade, man. It was a great trade. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that's the, I, I do believe Gunner that that's part of the reason that, um, that we got, that we got digs. Um, so appreciate that question. It says favorite podcast, go Texans. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you very, very much. Ooh, I'm running out of juice on my laptop. I can't have this podcast go out. There we go. Charging up. All right. Last one is from my man, coach middle screen, middle screen, emailing in. I love it says, I've become obsessed with the Texans' defensive snap counts and personnel usage. The Texans have aligned with two corners and two linebackers basically every single play all year. Basically, what he's saying is they're lined up a nickel for a majority, vast majority, if not all of the game. He says, I don't even have to look it up. I can guarantee you this has never happened in the NFL before through the first five games of a season. What is your take on this? Does Ryans want to do this? Jalen Petrie is playing like 50% nickel and 50% linebacker. They just keep the same dudes in the back seven out on the field all game long. It's amazing. I truly believe this should be the most talked about thing in the NFL this year. Okay, I don't know about most talked about thing. Middle screen has a sarcastic side to him, so I'm going to assume that was sarcasm but about it being the most talked about thing in the NFL. Um, I think there's a few things at work. I think not having Christian Harris is a major, major thing when it comes to the decisions that they're making on who to use uh, in defensive personnel. They're not a deep linebacker room. And the linebackers they have behind Toa Toa and Aziz Alshire are either have some major deficiency, you know, Jake Hansen, undersized, Neville Hewitt, kind of a, a thumper, a run-only guy, not a great guy in coverage. He's a special teams guy. Jamal Hill just has zero experience. So the, he would immediately become a kill spot for opposing offensive coordinators. So I think you feel like, look, Jalen Petrie, he's for what he does when he's in there for that 50% of the, being a linebacker, he's undersized, but he is a very willing tackler, a very willing hitter, if not at times an undisciplined tackler because he misses some tackles. Um, but I think that's the biggest thing. I think once they get Christian Harris back middle screen, I think they're going to, you're going to see more, you know, conventional four, three defense. If, if I had to guess, I think that's the biggest thing. They just don't have a ton of linebackers. You know, they the, the, they they would rather have Jalen Petrie out there than Jamal Hill out there. You know, or I guess in the case they Jalen would be out there anyways. But they'd rather have they'd rather slide Jalen up and have Eric Murray at safety or Kalen Bullock at safety than than have Jamal Hill out there or Neville Hewitt out there as a third linebacker. And that part makes sense. Now it makes them very light as a defense size wise. So how long does that hold up? I don't know. But I think that's the biggest reason. I think when Chris, once Christian Harris, well, if Christian Harris ever comes back, um, maybe that changes. All right, HOU mailbag at gmail.com. You can see it at the bottom of the screen there. Appreciate the emails. Great job, guys, this week. Thumbs up. Hopefully the Texans give us more good stuff to sink our teeth into this weekend against New England. There will be a preview episode dropping on Friday morning. I think that's going to become my time to drop the preview is on Friday morning. Keep it consistent. So Friday morning, we'll get a preview. I will have a review of the what is hopefully a win over the Patriots. Uh, I record those on Sunday night. You may not see them till Monday morning, um, but I keep all that very, very tight. You know, we do the six pack to preview. We do four winners, four losers, and we got the mailbag in between. So um, again, email mailbag at gmail.com. Uh, subscribe, rate, and review if you would like. Hit that subscribe button and you get the podcast automatically. Thanks to Anthony Irwin, my producer, for getting the podcast out to you. Thank you all of you for listening and all of you who emailed for your questions. I will talk to you uh, on Friday for a preview of Texans Patriots and keep it tuned to sports radio 610 all week long. We appreciate that as well. Have a great day, everybody. 